I'm Keats Elliott and I am a co-founder of ShootSec. We knew that we had a need and all we needed to do was connect the, uh, the right product with the people who needed it and we would have a business. So the biggest um, wedding and portrait photographer trade show every year is in Las Vegas in March. So in January, you know, like the second week of January, we decided we were going to we were going to be there, you know. So we booked a booth and uh, and we started. And um, I thought, you know, we'll go hire a bag designer. Well, there I don't know, you know, they're hard to find bag designers. So we ended up um, we ended up at a at a woman down in Orange County who makes uh, she ma she's been in business forever helping people design bags for surfboards. You know, I mean, we found random people. There really wasn't anybody who was going to say this is how you should do it. So it was just a lot of personal time put into, you know, testing and trying and getting somebody to sew and do the parts you don't do. There was nothing there to target women, so we were attracting an audience that those other companies had never seen attracted before. Um, it was very visual, the way that the booth was set up. It was, um, we used fabrics, we had these mannequins hanging around. So it was very out of context for a photography show. We got to be on the floor with people. I got to go through the sales pitch with them. I knew what I wanted it to do, but I got to hear what they wanted it to do. So we were able to come back with 250 orders, which was enough to get my, my whole process started. We um, both put in $10,000 to give us a $20,000 startup and, uh, and we ran everything else off my credit card. So there wasn't actually a business loan or any of that stuff. We didn't go get financing from anyone. Um, and we were, again, we were pretty lucky because I knew we had a place to sell it immediately and an audience we could reach. Um, and I think those are issues for a lot of um, startup companies. Um, we knew we could run a, an online website very inexpensively. So our costs really were design. We looked at kind of a mid-range of bags and we also factored in the fashion element. We're not making anybody buy this. This is something they're choosing to buy and they're choosing to buy it because of the image. So we, we played off of that Prada thing a little bit. You know, we, um, Jessica and I have had discussions. We have these fabric, these interchangeable fabric flaps and, you know, in my head, I'm like, well, it's just one little thing of fabric, you know. We did put lens cleaning cloth on the back, you know, but it really, you know, it's the equivalent of like a napkin, you know, and so I'm like, well, what can we price that at you know well if you stick with the functionality only you feel like well you know $29 is probably you know can change the look of the bag for $29 that's easy to say I can roll that off my tongue but Jess actually was really gutsy and she's like let's do you know basic fabrics more elaborate fabrics and then let's do couture let's go all the way you know so she smacked $79 on some of our fabrics and I was like it's never gonna happen it's never gonna happen they were gone sold, gone. So there was something about the limited qu limited quantity of them. There's something about the, um, the ability to actually have it be a reflection of the brand that that person is creating. Um, and there was also something about the fashion part of it. I mean, why is a Prada bag a Prada bag? Or why is a Chanel bag a Chanel bag? It's like there's something about it. There's a mystique built with it. I had made the mistake with my own photography business of not wanting to invest in a business card and a brand and whatever. And it was one of the hugest mistakes I ever made because because just having a business card and having a logo that you are proud of, it immediately makes you feel like a company. So that's one thing I've done both ways and I would say that that was so worth investing in. And what I can say is that from the moment we became something that people could see publicly, they were seeing a company that looked real. Getting into manufacturing has been really challenging and um, part of that is, you know, finding a factory to do the work here, considering taking the work to China. I wanted very much to have an American-based company and to use an American company and um, the product is made out of neoprene so we have a wetsuit factory down in Huntington Beach and again I loved being able to drive there, talk to them, see how it's being made. Um, feeling like I can pick up the phone and call if there's an issue. So it's like I was really willing to pay to have that be my home base. 
Um, and what I found was um, th while they were willing to work with me to get us up and running, they're not willing to stay price competitive. And I wasn't even asking them to match a China price for me because I get it, you know, it's not the same. Um, but I wanted them to give me a number that would at least be interesting for them and doable for me. And it was really interesting. I, I went to three different companies and found that um, they're really shockingly not interested in my business. Now, I think there was an initial underestimating of what my business was going to look like. But what they did was they pushed me into exploring China. So that was a huge scary thing to explore China and I'm still not 100% sure that we're doing it the right way. There's a ton of brokers that help you, you know, find a factory that can do the work you want to do. You know, and we ended up, I, I found a bag, um, a diaper bag that has silk fabric on it and I figured whoever can do this will probably be able to help me on the other side. And so we were working with that company and that's been a pretty, you know, lengthy back and forth process and dealing with China has been a lot of, you know, if you want something changed, it takes three or four weeks back and forth just to even see the change and if it's not right, you know, so it's taken a long time to get a perfect bag. But we finally did place our first China order. The brokers have managed to position it so that my contract is actually with an American-based company. And if there's anything, that any discussions that need to have, any, any contracts between the two of us are between my company and another American company. And they are the ones incurring the risk with China. Um, they're the ones who are also there making sure it's done correctly. The bags will be brought here and I will buy them from them as I need them. So now I'm sure I'm paying, I'm sure I'm paying a premium for that, but they were still able to take the cost of my bag and cut it in half for me. The first company that we're working with is actually local. And I liked it because it's someplace I can drive down, I can talk to them and say, hey, I'm you know, having issues with this, I want to get it worked out. There's, you know, they're sweet, they put my name up on the sign when I walk in, you know. Um, so there's all that kind of creature comfort stuff with them. Um, but the new company that I'm considering is in Wisconsin. And so the more I thought about it, there really is no benefit to me um, to having them be here other than I have to ship the product when it comes in to a different location. I'm shipping it to Irvine now. You know, here we are in California, so it's local to me, but I actually, there's no reason not to just go ahead and ship it to Wisconsin. And one benefit of a place in the middle of the country is that my customer costs will be less going out from both sides. So that's something, I mean, because instead of being in California and having coast to coast issues, we actually can be in the middle where there'll be no, you know, coast to coast issues. So that's kind of an advantage to them as well. Um, I don't know, they were able to give me much better rates um, it, you know, I've, I researched companies here in this area and they were all pretty much the same. It was, you know, moving this number to that number, but it was all the same amount of money. So it's, it's interesting that really looking outside of my own state and my local area actually did produce a much cheaper result. I wanted the retailers to see the, the audience I can bring for them and the, and the fuss and the buzz. I wanted them to see that. And um, it's been largely a kind of an old boys kind of industry. And there's the statistics are actually really high about the number of women in photography now, and particularly in wedding and portrait photography. So it was important for me to be able to have those people see that women are buying. And it's really, I mean, I think it's very short-sighted in the sense uh, they have had a very short-sighted view. The majority of the industry had been men, and now they're not sure what to do with the women. But the reality is I own the computer, I own the $5,000 camera, I own all the lenses. I'm a buyer, you know? So anything they can do in their retail environment to draw me in is good for them. And certainly a product like the shoot sack is actually visually stunning and interesting to get a woman into the store. I'm already buying equipment, you know? So it's really, I think, the first product that's actually been targeted towards women in that environment. So I think what I'm gonna do next, instead of us going retail and having our own retail space, is I'm actually gonna get this product into the stores, into retail hands, and let them actually use it to draw audiences in for them. we had our first knockoff already. So the good thing about uh, first knockoff is that, you know, what was designed at my dining room table is now industry standard, right? You know, somebody's, somebody's knocking off the other bag and I'm like, well, I guess we can be flattered, you know? Um, but again, that started that process of, do you need a patent? What is patentable about a bag? You know, a bag is a bag. It's very difficult to find um, to find out what makes something patentable. So I did some research and I ended up meeting with five or six attorneys and 
one thing I would say about this process is that um, an attorney is not an attorney is not an attorney. They're different. You know, just like one photographer is not the same as another. So as I went and met with attorneys, what I kind of got was there's the I don't really want to work with you. It doesn't seem like there's anything in it for me kind of way. There's the, you know, the old school by the book way. And finally I started saying to somebody, I understand that I may not have any rights based on A, B, C. I'm looking for a cowboy way because I'm kind of an out of the box girl and I have kind of an out of the box problem that I'd like to address, you know. And so I was looking for a more creative thinker, somebody to work with me on that. And you'd think, you know, I don't know, it never occurred to me, but like with an attorney I was able to actually I was actually able to sit and, t and say what I needed to say until I found somebody who could, out of the box, come up with a way for us to address the problem. By paying for the patent, I'm investing in the idea that this company owns something that another company might want to purchase. My initial interest with creating ShootSack was to see, can I create something? Can I take an idea and make it real? And. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I got to that place where I was able to say, okay, I did it, you know. And I have, I'm working with this business coach, and uh, she actually said to me, so are you done? And I thought, well, with that, you know, with creating it, I'm definitely done. You know, I'm finished. You know, I, I did it. It's here, you know. Um, so she said, if you're done, you can move on or you could come up with a new purpose for this. And I decided, okay, so my new purpose with ShootSack is to make money. I wanna see if I can make this thing make money. And that actually clarified a lot of stuff for me because a lot of what I was suffering from was, a, was like information overload and the way I think businesses should be overload. You know, so if I can if I can weed it all down to the new purpose with ShootSack is to make money, then there's a lot of things I can look at and say, is this is this going to make money immediately? You know, those things should go at the top of the list. Is this going to make money for us long term? Those things go next on the list. You know, it's helping me to filter the amount of things that I believe need to happen. Sometimes it helps to actually have that big goal out there and then to actually do the backwards list. What would have happened the day before that? You know, and what happened the day before that? And what happened the day before that? So that you can actually start to see the things that you need to figure out. And then giving yourself a break and saying, I can't possibly know all these things from the chair I'm sitting in right here, but I could certainly get up and take some steps. You know, I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's like, I want to get from here to there, and I'm not going to be naive enough to believe that I know everything from here to there, because those are the easy goals. If you already knew how to do it, you would be doing it, you know? So the ones where you really want to try and accomplish something big, the only way that I've figured it out is to be able to admit that I have no idea what's going to be next, but I'm open to seeking advice, finding help, you know, asking questions. And I think that that's a, it's a really uncomfortable spot to be in. I, I have felt very vulnerable not knowing. Um, but I've also really found, and it, it's kind of just a, a great way that the world works, that like, if I put it out there that that's where I'm headed, this is the direction I'm headed, if I put one foot out there, it seems like the people and the resources and the things that you need to hear and see and know kind of show up, you know? Whereas if I had stayed seated, unwilling to say, this is what I want to do, um, I would still not be able to see what's just right out that door.